Proceedings are resumed. Please be seated. Private Members Motion Number 2 of 2015, Extension of Public School Work Experience Program, to be moved by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, the second elected member for Georgetown. Mr. Speaker, I crave the indulgence of the House in accordance with Standing Order 2414 to withdraw private member's motion number two of 2015 on today's order paper, standing in my name. Is there a seconder? I recognize the Honorable Leader of Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I second the motion. Standing Order 2414 reads as follows. A motion may be withdrawn with the leave of the House, but if so withdrawn, it may be made again at another meeting of the House after notice has been given as required by paragraph five. I now put the question that private members motion number two of 2015, extension of public school work experience program be withdrawn by virtue of Standing Order 2414. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, those against, no. Private members, motion number two of 2015, extension of public school work experience program has been withdrawn. Other business, private members, motion number three of 2015. Um, Mentoring program in a public high school to be moved by the leader of the opposition, first elected member for Georgetown. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the motion number three of 2015 mentoring program in public high schools, which reads as follows. Whereas the involvement of non-familial adults in the life of youth have been shown to be beneficial in the development of self-esteem, of their self-esteem and decision-making abilities, and whereas mentoring programs have been known to increase an array of opportunities for youth, especially at risk, and whereas there is no official mentoring program within the public high schools available to students, be it now therefore resolved that the government considers implementing a formal mentoring program within the public high schools to promote the personal and professional development of students with specific on the at risk youth. Thank you. Private member's motion number three of 2015, mentoring program in high schools, has been duly moved. Is there a seconder to the motion? I recognize the sixth elected member for George Georgetown. Mr. Speaker, I beg to second private member's motion number three of 2015. <laughs> mentoring program in public high schools. The motion has been duly moved and seconded. Does the mover wish to speak? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to propose private members notion number three to set in place a formal mentoring program within our public high schools. Mr. Speaker, I've read the statistics over and over again. For example, X number of students are failing this subject and why a number of students aren't showing up to school. But me reading out statistics that we already know doesn't help the situation. Mentors have the potential to, to modify or even reverse the negative development trajectories of the at-risk youth, Jean E. Rhodes. Michael Miles, a licensed of, a liaison officer who deals with at-risk youth, defined it to be young people who run the risk 
of not achieving the basic knowledge, skills, and attitude necessary for becoming productive adults. This is where, Mr. Speaker, the realization that being a youth means you are faced with both positive and negative peer pressure. One's own unique condition at home and at school can play a crucial role in the development of a child. Also, factors such as bullying, abuse, and the list goes on. By staying with specific emphasis on the at-risk youth, we were trying to focus our aims mainly at those who are underperforming in school to reduce the development of child delinquency, which has links to crime. Our hope is that we can enlighten students about what is out there for them, to show them that there's more, to help them see their own potential as young people, to guide and show them that yes, there are people out there looking out for them, to show them that there are people who are willing to spend the time with them for the bettering of themselves and the community. Mentoring programs have been known to be a great way to get youth back on track. I interviewed an adult to share his experience with mentoring growing up as a child in Cayman and how it has infected his life. He started off by saying he didn't have a father and the men and teachers in his community were there for him. He said that they saw something in him that he didn't. They willingly volunteered themselves and their time to become his mentors. They gave him encouragement for him to do better and to be better and to carry himself as a leader. They gave him somewhere to be, the protection of the community. Mentoring shamed him to be the man he is today. From, his, from, his, from this experience, Mr. Speaker, I have seen that mentoring can be both life-changing and encouraging to mentees. The mentoring program, Mentor Cayman, by the Chamber of Commerce is one of the many well-known mentoring programs in Cayman, but they only mentor a limited number of 50 students per school year. Research done by Stephen A. Small at the University of Wisconsin states that frequent contact between mentors and mentees are important. The strongest effects of men for mentoring are found between those who meet an hour or more per week. And relationships one year longer are more likely to lead to positive outcomes in youth. The mentoring program that we have in mind is intended to do just that. We also plan to screen our students so that mentors can better understand their mentees and set targets that can help them. Based on these screenings, we find it very effective to match mentors and mentees with similar interests and skills. This, we hope, can lead to the development of strong bonds that last a lifetime. I strongly recommend that young people between the ages of 17 and 25 are used to mentor the students. Young people speak their own language. Getting adults to do it, in all honesty, is not going to have the same impact as youth mentoring another youth. We also want to train our mentors, specifically the ones aged 17 to 25, to have an understanding of the issues that their mentees are facing, as well as training in relationship building, as this is essential for mentee and the mentor to deepen their bond. I would like to suggest a small working group to be established which consists of professionals such as teachers, because they are the ones who interact mostly with their students. They can easily identify new trends in a student when changes are happening. They know this by homework not being done in time, not showing up to school on a regular basis, etc. It is said that experience is life's greatest teacher. We would also like to involve people who have experience in mentoring youth, along with people who are professions that are willing to share their knowledge and experience to students who are interested in the same field as they are working in. I would like to close by saying, it all, all it takes to get through to someone is to show them that you are there for them, willing to help and that you care, which is why we want to implement a mentoring program that can show Cayman's youth in the public high schools that the right path. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? I recognize the fourth elected member for Georgetown.
Mr. Speaker, I raise to your offer a short contribution to the debate in regards to the positive impact of home life brought by op mentoring on opposition motion number three, in which they are proposing that the government implement mentoring programs for at-risk youth in our public schools. How mentoring improves home life. The development of our island's youth is the most fundamental thing that comes to mind. Mr. Speaker, you may be asking, what is at-risk youth? It's the youth that have characteristics such as emotional and behavioral problems that make them less likely to transition successfully into adulthood and therefore needs intervention. This can be achieved through positive mentoring. I have found as a young person going through our island's public system that mentoring would be a great accommodation to our society and a mentoring program would help us understand what is needed in a healthy functioning society. I've done research on this subject and found an article written by Dr. L Linda Jones of Millersville University, 100 Ideas to Use When Mentoring Youth, which is very much to the point. She came up with several ideas based on interviews and observations of mentors and mentees. Some of the ideas deal with how mentors should act and take part in the lives of mentees for their general improvement and their home life. Most of the ideas require active involvement with and could take place during meetings and outings. Her topics and suggestions are for ages 10 to 18. What I've learned from her article is that some should be fun and others more serious, all designed to help the mentee develop socially, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, and physically. One of the ideas for a mentor is, to visit the, is a visit to the college campus with a mentee of 16 or 17 years old. Have a snack in the cafe, have a walk around the campus, talk about college opportunities. Most, of, most importantly, the mentor should become part of the mentee's lives, visit them at home, call them on the phone, become a friend. As a great philosopher, Plato wrote in 428 BC, do not train a child to learn by force or harshness, but direct them to it by what amuses their minds. I think as a mentee, you, should, you have to practice doing a lot of stuff that you do not like to be a better person. By now, you're most likely thinking, how does this improve home life? It does in several ways. The improvement of self-esteem, social skills, and relationships with siblings and their parents. Mr. Speaker, as social studies has taught me, self-esteem is based on who you are and the, re the relationships and experiences you've had at home, in school, and in the community. You form a self-image based on these experiences and relationships and positive experiences and relationships contribute to healthy self-esteem. And negative experiences and relationships contribute to poor self-esteem. Mentor, mentored youth should tend to trust their parents more and communicate better with them. Home life is sure to improve as a result. Mentoring works. Big brother and big sister programs are mentoring programs around the world. The big brother and big sister program did a public slash private study showing that 52% of youth is mentored is less likely to do drugs and 27% less likely to start drinking. In my opinion, the Big Brother and Big Sister program would flourish if we had more volunteers and support. Based on the above, there can be no doubt that mentoring would improve home life. I believe helping our youth in this way would really pay off, not just now, but in years to come. It would impact the Cayman Islands in a big way. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I have offered a clear rationale to the debate for the implementation of a mentoring program demonstrated by the positive effects on home life. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? I recognize the Honorable Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the Minister of Education, I rise to offer a brief contribution to this debate on Opposition Motion Number 3, in which they are proposing that government implement mentoring programs in our schools, programs specifically focused on at-risk youth. In my debate, I will examine what a mentoring program is, the main advantages and disadvantages of mentoring programs, and I will also talk about the mentoring programs that are currently run or supported by the Ministry of Education. I will also talk about why these programs should not only be implemented in the high schools, 
but the primary schools as well. Mr. Speaker, first of all, let's look at the definition of at-risk youth. An at-risk youth has characteristics such as emotional and behavioral problems that make them less likely to transition success successfully into adulthood and therefore needs intervention. If we use that definition, then the opposition motion would be speaking to students that fall in that category. Mr. Speaker, what exactly is a mentoring program? According to wikipedia.com, a youth mentoring program is a program in which mentors are matched with young people who need or want a caring, responsible adult in their lives. Mr. Speaker, the government supports the idea of mentoring programs. And in fact, over the years, there have been several different mentoring programs, including the Chamber Mentoring Program. The government would recommend that the mentoring programs be considered not only for high school students, but for, primary, for students in primary schools as well. Mentoring programs can be done in different ways. A mentoring program doesn't necessarily always mean a one-on-one -on -one relationship with one person or mentor. A tutorial teacher in schools, for example, can be a mentor to several students. Mr. Speaker, what exactly are the main advantages and disadvantages of mentoring programs? The main advantages are one, they help to build mentee social skills. Two, according to the Eyes of World Developer document, the youth mentoring programs change the perspectives and improve the life opportunities of at-risk youth. Rigorous studies of effectiveness of mentoring programs find positive but modest effects on some mentees. Three, by providing positive role models, mentors promote resiliency among at-risk youth. The main disadvantages are one, Mentoring programs tend to not be the best at improving youth's academic performance. And two, the mentee may become too dependent on his or her mentor. The government still supports this motion as we have found ways to combat these disadvantages. Mr. Speaker, in the high schools, each student has a tutorial teacher. So as I have already mentioned before, why not use tutorial teachers? These teachers usually get 20 to 30 minutes a day with students. And during this time, they can sit with students and talk about their school life and personal life and help to provide guidance to keep them on the right path. In the book, Pushes Come to Shove, Dr. Steve Perry said, successful academic experiences assign every child an advisor. An advisor, specifically a teacher in the case of a school or a mentor in the case of an out of school program. So why can't we use tutorial teachers or assign other teachers based on gender to students to be their advisor and help guide them. Under this system, all essential components are already in place in the high schools. The Department of Education would only need to implement it in all schools. Mr. Speaker, there are already mentoring programs supported by the government. Firstly, there is the Chamber of Commerce Mentoring Program, which mainly focuses on the overachievers in the schools. This program has been running successfully over the years due to its set guidelines. There is also the Junior Achievement Mentoring Program, which is an example of using one mentor for more than one student. This program not only helps students learn what a business works like, but advisors in the company mentor the students. This mentoring program, their fellow employees in the group also mentor the students. Now, Mr. Speaker, if the government is set regulations and operate like these mentoring programs, this program will become successful and make an impact on youth's lives. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned before, this mentoring program should not only be considered for high school students, but also for primary students. Upon my research, it is shown that if a problem is dealt with early on in a child's life, they are more likely to have a brighter future. An example of a primary school mentoring program is the Kids Hope OS, which is a mentoring program for primary school children in Australia. Results from this program have shown that children who are mentored at an early age grow up to become bright students. So if the problem is nipped in the bud, a strong foundation is developed in the child's life, which reduces possible future consequences, leading to a better Cayman. Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, the motion presented by the opposition today has its merits and the government supports mentoring programs in our school system. In fact, I gave examples earlier in my speech. However, Mr. Speaker, mentoring programs should not be limited to at-risk youth. Our research has shown 
that mentoring programs can be beneficial at all ages and mentoring programs don't always require one-on-one -on -one mentors with students. I gave examples of tutorial teachers mentoring more than one student. So Mr. Speaker, the government s supports this motion and we will implement the program with the suggested changes put forward by my colleagues and myself. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? I recognize the fourth elected member for Bodden Town. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my colleague, the first elected member of Georgetown has stated, the, Im the implementation of mentoring program within the government administrated schools would be an invaluable resource to the Cayman education system. This program would specifically target tar at risk youth of the Cayman Islands and yet continue to cater to every high school student and give them a role model that they can use to help guide them. The at risk youth, which refers to those with recurring delinquent behavior actions and those lacking the desire to further their education to achieve the ability to be a productive member of society have been in a sense left behind or left to squander away their life by teachers, peers and other adults present in a child's life and parents. How are we supposed to further the Cayman Islands if the next generation of society is being left by those who are supposed to help them? How are we going to help that child realize that he or she is worth the time and the effort that they matter just as much as anybody? The answer is simple, mentoring. Mentoring, according to the management mentors of North America, means a professional relationship in which an experienced person, the mentor, assists another, the mentee, in developing a specific skills and knowledge that will enhance the less experienced person's professional and personal growth. By definition alone, mentoring shows that it is exactly what is needed to help those who are left behind or who have been seen as a waste of time. Those who have been labeled as these things are the youth in need of the guidance given within this program. With our plan of implementing this program, the opposition has looked into the positive along with the negative. I can safely state that the positive outweighs the negative. The opposition does not intend to watch this program succumb to problems that may arise and fall to failure. Instead, we intend to fix these problems. Concerning those of the implementation of the mentoring program within the schools, these problems are the typical inhibitors of forward movement. Inhibitors such as working class citizens having busy schedules, liability issues for the child, possibility of an ill-influencing mentor, and those who commit to this program for the sake of it being a show of their giving back to the community when applying for residency. These entire drawbacks have a solution in which can provide positive feedback in the program. In the way of countering the, program, the problem with working class citizens having jobs and other obligations, the program would work out specific date in which the mentor and mentee could meet that would fit in with both the schedule of both participants. The solution to the problem of arising liability issues would be to have the program be set on school campuses in which the mentor would meet them, his mentee on those set dates. In terms of the possibility of an ill-influencing mentor and people using this program to gain in the form of residency, there would be a strict and rigorous screening process in which we would determine whether the mentor is adequate for the job and the program for the right reasons. As we have stated, all of these supposed drawbacks have a set solution. Another key feature to this program would be the allowance of released inmates who have made the adaptation to society and have changed their ways. To be a part of this program and give them back so they can leave a mark on their community by passing along knowledge of past insufficiencies of what could happen to them if they do not change their ways from someone who has experienced it. This first-hand experience would build a bond with a child whom realizes that this isn't the lifestyle for him or her than the ability to change his life around before it is too late. Mr. Speaker, I have personally had the opportunity to be a part of Mentoring Cayman that is put on yearly by the Chamber of Commerce. This experience of being mentored by an individual who looked out for my best interests, who gave me advice on issues in life and motivated me to do my best and reach my goals was a life-changing experience. It brought about a sense of self-realization in terms of me being able to look at myself and realize that I am worth it. 
Now, I do understand that the Chamber of Commerce mentoring Cayman is for young individuals who are seen as the brightest, those who are upcoming leaders in the Cayman Islands. This begs the question, why should we focus on those who are already excelling in school and life when we have those who are left behind, who are being forgotten about? This shouldn't be the case. Those who are in need of help should be given the help that they need and deserve, and not just by passed over. Instead of judging them for their mistakes, why not help them with the problems so that they can learn and grow into productive citizens in society and give back to their community? After all, we are one country, and it's our job to secure the future so that future generations to come can also be mentored and given the chance to make something of themselves and further the Cayman Islands. I stand for the implementation of mentoring in our schools, not just for the ability to say that we have given back to the people, but to say that we have done this for our future. We have done this with the risk in mind. Thank you once again, Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? I recognize the second elected member for Cayman Brack and Little Cayman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I would like to say that an at-risk youth can be defined as a student or a young person who has characteristics such as emotional or behavioral problems that makes them less likely to progress successfully into adulthood and therefore needs intervention. Secondly, according to Wikipedia, a youth mentoring program is a program in which mentors are matched with young people who needs or wants a caring, responsible adult in their life. If mentoring programs are expected to be used as an intervention so that at-risk youth can get the help they need, there should be some benefits which I will address in my speech. These mentoring programs should also provide the following benefits which should help mostly the at-risk youth in years 4 to 6 in primary schools and 10 to 12 in high schools. These mentoring programs should provide a decrease in delinquency behavior in primary and high school youth by making them gain positive practical advice in, with encouragement and support from their mentors. Mentoring should allow youth to become more interactive with their peers and relatives. Even though some youth might be more open to mentors, this should be used to help them understand on the decision-making process which will help them in school and home. Mentoring programs should also give at-risk youth the opportunity to gain better grades than usual. This should be done so that youth can feel better about him or herself and result in an increase in higher grades for the youth. While the youth is gaining this benefit, he or she should be able to identify more goals so that they can create a sense of direction in order to develop strategies of overcoming other personal and academic problems. Other benefits which should be derived from mentoring programs is a decrease of dropout rates and truancy in primary and high schools, especially in high school. This should be done so that youth can, get, can achieve more in high, their school time. This could be done by showing at-risk youth how to overcome academic problems. An increase at graduation rates in high schools should also be a benefit for mentoring programs so that youth can get a head start in life and the real world and prevent, the path, prevent them from taking the path of drugs and alcoholism. This should also give a helping hand of decreasing the rate of youth relapsing into criminal behavior. As a government, we have carefully considered the possible benefits of implementing a mentoring program in our schools should the motion be passed. Keeping in mind the be possible benefits, I strongly believe this would be an ideal way in which can help our young society to achieve their goals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? 
I recognize the Honorable Minister of Community Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise in support of the private member's motion number three. However, I would like to speak on the cons of mentoring programs holistically, which I feel will add a healthy debate to this motion. Um, before I continue, I would like to thank um, the second, second elected member for Cayman Brack and Little Cayman for stating the advantages of this motion. Um, but I will state some of the disadvantages. Um, for, before I continue, I'd like to state what at-risk youth are. Um, at-risk youth um, are youth that have characteristics such as emotional or behavioral problems that make them less likely to transition successfully into adulthood and therefore need intervention. Um, many researchers have suggested that advantages of the mentoring programs can be um, increased productivity, cost-effectiveness, improved recruitment efforts, increased organizational communication, motivation of senior staff, and improvisation in strategic and succession planning. However, researchers have also suggested that there are also potential challenges or negative aspects of formal mentoring. First, the issue of implementation of the mentoring program, when there are few opportunities for advancement within an organization which lead to frustration for the mentees. Second, second issue um, raised is the danger of allowing a mentoring program to proceed when there is no complete organization commitment to the program. Thirdly, the concern about organizations that have encountered difficulties endeavoring to coordinate existing ongoing training or human resource program, um, program sorry, with new mentoring programs. Fourth concern is the potential difficulty to convince management to implement a mentoring program when there is a relative lack of hard data justifying the effectiveness of such programs. Fifth concern raised is um, the complexity and potential expensive administration that it will take to run such a program associated with this um, that incorporates cross-functional pairing. Um, other potential concerns or drawbacks of formal mentoring that have been raised by researchers and summarized as such. Um, favoritism, the resentment that may arise among non-participants within the program. Um, the unrealistic promotional expectations, which means that men mentees may expect to become something that they're not able to become because of human resources. And the over-dependence on use of the mentor because the mentor may be, um, become very dependent upon by the mentee and the mentee may become over-dependent on the mentor. Unsuccessful matching of mentors and mentees. Um, the mentor um, and mentee may not get along together. They may not um, show um, sort of like the same chemistry. Um, the lack of understanding of the mentoring process, poor planning of the mentoring process, um, potential for mentoring to create work tensions. Um, mentoring is also time consuming for all of those concerned. Few available mentors, especially women. Um, lack of access to mentoring for women and minority groups. Reproduction of the mentor's work style. Gender issues, um, which I will state in a short while. And the lack of a sound theoretical base for the program, such as there is no solid theory in place to support the, that these programs do work and are effective. The informal or traditional cross-gender mentoring relationships concerns are um, such as risks when mentoring relationships become, they can become sexual as well, other, when others perceive the relationship as sexual, and when the mentoring relationship becomes distant as a mean with coping with sexual innuendo, so that the mentor and the mentee may have a sexual relationship and a sexual advancement may occur during this mentoring process. There's also a shortage, there may also be a shortage of formal staff to be included in the mentoring process. 
However, um, it is argued that group mentoring may help overcome shortages of experienced mentors and facilitate mentees learning from each other as well as from the mentor. It is said to be feasible that group mentoring may also help some of the gender's concerns associated with the mentoring programs. Um, again, the poor relationship between the mentor and mentee and the high, visit, high visibility of the mentoring program, lack of clarity as to whether um, mentoring is linking career advancement um, and, insu and insufficient funding or termination of funding before the program can demonstrate its potential benefit fully. Um, concerns on an organizational level can be cost related, where the costs associated with the implementation of the program can be covered by anticipated outcomes. Um, whether there is a willingness to demonstrate ongoing support for the program. And concerns on a men mentee level, um, they can be hurt in a poorly planned or implement an implemented program by unrealistic expectations of what the program promised them but did not outcome to what it was supposed to be. Um, when there is obviously no clear promotional path for these mentees. Um, the mentor's concerns, um, do they have the capacities required to be a mentor? Are they to be rewarded for being a mentor? Um, how will they be selected? What is the criteria for them to become a mentor? Um, how will they be trained or will they be trained? What criteria will be used to match them with a mentee? Overloading of already overburdened with organizational matters and professional responsibilities of these few available mentors. Having just spoken on these negative points of the mentoring program, however, I am still in favor of this motion um, being implemented, implemented based upon these concerns taking into consideration in order to maximize the program's success for its full potential. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? I recognize the third elected member for West Bay. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, all members of this youth parliament have shown me that they are responsible, logical, and articulate people. As you know, they have researched and debated issues that most would find mundane and insignificant. However, they have all done so in the name of change. I have worked alongside these notable characters for a number of months now, and have found that most of them did not possess this determined mindset. I have learned about their suffering in this farce we call a public education system. Some not all, were forced to make decisions on matters they were clueless to make. Those selected few were punished for their uninformed decisions. They were lost, Mr. Speaker. They had no conceptual idea on what to do with their lives. They were simply nomads being forced through an ancient system, which in itself is a grotesque failure to its purpose and to the public. Now over time, my nomadic colleagues all found their respective paths. However, it was partly due to reason or guidance from someone or something. I do believe that although these members of this youth parliament are a great representation of Cayman's youth, they are not revealing the full truth. There are some students, Mr. Speaker, who have remained lost and have gone astray. Those terrible and unfortunate few are stuck in a desolate labyrinth and all they needed, Mr. Speaker, was somebody to show them the way. They needed a mentor. Mr. Speaker, as my colleagues have articulately explained, that our motion is about developing a mentoring program which benefits all. It is about shaping the future of Cayman at its most critical level. Now, of course, every action we take has both a quantitative and qualitative cost, the primary of which can be roughly calculated. Please take note that all figures are in Cayman dollars. According to research done by the National Mentoring Partnership, a US organization, the average cost per child per year for a mentoring match ranges from $1,820 for a school-based mentoring program to $1,230 for a community-based mentoring program. 
Now, Mr. Speaker, let's take the total amount of students in all secondary public schools, which according to the National Education Data Report of 2013, is 2,530 students. May I remark that is quite a small number as well. That brings the maximum cost of mentoring at roughly $3.1 million per annum, and the minimum at $2 million per year. So if we were to, take, to include all students in the public education system, from primary to secondary, as anyone pr could predict, the cost would be substantially higher, with the total maximum cost at $6 million per year, and the minimum at $4 million. Now, the allocation of this money will be toward a variety of things, like paying the salaries of highly skilled and professional staff dedicated to this program. You may argue that recruiting volunteers would decrease the cost, and you would be right. However, you would be hopelessly wrong to think that you would get the same quality work from few volunteers compared to a high quality staff. A second cost would be the recruitment campaigns to attract potential volunteers to the mentoring program. Now, the cost of running these ca campaigns can be very low. However, that is solely dependent on the efficiency of your staff. Of course, another item to address on the bill is performing interviews, checking references, and screening criminal backgrounds of each potential mentor. The cost of performing the screening decreases as your staff becomes more efficient. Then finally, it is a cost of training, support, and monitoring of both mentee and mentor relationships. As I have said over and over, these are costs that can and will go down, Mr. Speaker, with a logical and hardworking staff and faculty. So some of you may be possibly wondering who might be paying the costs. Well, obviously, as my colleague Kevin has said, it would be the government, since you are the facilitators of this program. Obviously, they wouldn't, I hope you wouldn't, be limiting yourselves to, their, to your own pockets. I'm sure that you would be happily accept funding from private entities, as my colleague Kevin has said. Now, Mr. Speaker, as you know, in any system or in life, if you make an investment of a substantial amount of anything from time to money, you will reap the benefits of your return. In 2007, the Bill and Melinda Fount Gates Foundation commissioned an independent evaluation to examine the services and effectiveness of mentoring programs for youth. The study found that just after 13 months, mentoring the mentees showed fewer to no depressive symptoms, greater acceptance of their peers, more positive beliefs that they can exceed in school, and most significant of all, better grades. Also, a study by Big Brother Big Sister, which has been quoted numerous times in this debate, found that youth who met regularly with their mentors are 46% less likely than their peers to start using illegal drugs, and 27% less likely to start drinking. Another study by Big Brother Big Sister said students who meet regularly with their mentors are 52% less likely than their peers to skip a day of school, and 37% less likely to skip a day. Now, Mr. Speaker, I could put you to sleep if I haven't already with countless studies and research to prove something that is almost intuitive, that having somebody there to care for you and guide you results in better quality of life for yourself. Correct? Thank you. Now, I would like to address some of the disadvantages, as the government has said. Uh, one, all the disadvantages I, I have heard are related to the staff and how much those disadvantages may cost, and as I've said over and over, that these disadvantages will go down as the staff increases in efficiency. And also, I would like to please correct one of the some time um, on the worries on time consumption. Time is something that we can't ignore. Time is something that's spent every, virtually every second. Anyway, to conclude. Mr. Speaker, legend has it that a government is supposed to do what's in the public's best interest. Let me ask you this. Is it not in the public's best interest that the youth of Cayman Islands is molded to be a high-achieving, ambitious people? Or isn't it also in the public's best interest that every child has a light to guide them through the dark and dangerous tunnels of life? So then, isn't it only right that this motion passes without exception? I mean, the only reason I can think of there being an exception is if somebody's filled with the iniquity that flows from the volcanic mountains of hell, that person would not only be going against the people they swore to serve, but would also be threatening the future of Cayman. Reason being is because removing the mentorship in public schools where it is most needed, you're removing the possibility of a highly educated and skillful workforce. workforce. Without a decent workforce, you can just throw the possibility of foreign investment completely out the window. However, I don't believe there are people with that level of gall among us. And even if they are, 
this is still a democracy. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, on installing mentorship, the benefits not only outweigh the costs, but also justifies them for today's youth and many more generations to come. Thank you. Does any other member wish to speak? I recognize the Deputy Governor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of private members motion number three. However, there is one question that persistently comes to mind. Has the opposition even bothered to take into account that there are existing mentoring programs which have already been in place for a number of years now? Obviously not, since we have heard the leader of the opposition say that he is only aware of one, which leads me to believe that insufficient research was done before bringing this motion forward. Mr. Speaker, we of the government have properly done our research and discovered that there are currently three mentoring programs available to the young people of the Cayman Islands. I have been assigned the task today of outlining these programs and considering the effectiveness of each in order to justify how the government intends to successfully implement this program should the motion be passed. The Chamber of Commerce initiated a, initiated a program roughly 10 years ago aimed towards student, students with high academic potential, where candidates from high school island-wide were asked to apply and a select few were chosen. The program began with all the chosen students participating in a workshop and then entailed each student meeting with his or her mentor for a day every month over a period of six months. This allowed for the students not only to shadow their mentors in a professional capacity, but also to have an idea of how their mentors live their lives outside of the work environment. I was impressed by the feedback I received from past students of the program, but the one flaw that stood out to me was the infrequency of interaction between mentor and student, therefore resulting in the mentor making less of an impact on the student's life than expected. In this proposed program, we have suggested that the frequency be increased to once a week so that the relationship between mentor and student is more likely to be stronger. Secondly, while this program has, be con has been considered effective thus far, it only focuses on students with high academic potential. The opposition has proposed a program with emphasis on at-risk youth, which is defined as young persons who possess characteristics such as emotional and behavioral problems that make them less likely to transition successfully into adulthood and therefore need intervention. In our schools, it is rare that these two student descriptions coincide. That is to say, students with high academic potential tend not to be at risk. This new program will allow the more non-academic students the privilege of early exposure to the professional world. Another mentoring program was set in motion a bit more recently. In fact, just September 2013 at John Gray High School. This program, however, focused on underachieving students in the high school and allowed, them, allowed for them to meet with their respective mentors once a week during a lunchtime to discuss their progress in school. The mentors who were selected from various fields in the world of work were asked to assist their students with preparation for their external examinations as well as how to overcome possible learning obstacles they may be faced with. Here, while the program did produce the expected result, I questioned the effectiveness of the program due to the limited space of time available for mentor-student meetings. Seeing as a lunchtime meeting can only last about 30 to 40 minutes at most, it is likely that the results could have been even better if the meetings had perhaps taken place after school, much like what is being proposed in this new program. In this new program, Mr. Speaker, the focus is, is on improving the social and personal aspects of the students' lives. It is likely that the students selected for the program may also be underachieving in school, since a positive co correlation has been identified between unstable home environments and low grades by teachers in the public sector. 
This suggests that working on a student's social and personal interactions may lead to an improvement in the classroom as well, which happens to be a goal for this program if set in place. Whereas the next program has been mentioned for statistical purposes, no one on the opposition has mentioned that there is a local branch. So last, but certainly not least, the Big Brothers Big Sisters of the Cayman Islands offers a mentoring program as well. From its establishment in the 1980s, the mentoring program can be school-based, community-based, or include group activities. Much like the program being proposed today, Mr. Speaker, the Big Brothers Big Sisters program aims to provide the the support a child needs to grow and mature in a positive way. The mentors meet with their students once a week to engage in academic or social activities, whichever takes precedence that day. This allows for growth in study habits as well as personal interaction for the student, which is what the government would like to see promoted if the opposition motion passes. As an old African proverb states, it takes a village to raise a child. In all three of the aforementioned programs, the mentors volunteered to fulfill these roles, which is the most effective way of recruiting mentors as it ensures that they are motivated and eager to engage in the lives of these students. If mentors for this program come together from all niches of the community to help improve the life of these students, it will undoubtedly be a success. While these three programs have achieved success of some form, their existence has provided the government with important do's and don'ts to consider when implementing this official mentoring program in the schools should this motion be passed. This being said, Mr. Speaker, I believe that this motion could lead to a positive impact on the lives of our youth and therefore should be passed with careful consideration of how the mentoring program will be executed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? I recognize the Honorable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to address a few words that the third elected member for West Bay said. Now, how can you expect us to put a price on the future of, of our youth? Can you? And I can personally say that I would take a cut in my salary in order to help fund this program. Also, you have only done half of your work. You still need to provide stats that show us that this will only increase. The price, that is. As we are coming out of a recession, that means prices are going down. Now. We can say that the price would overall rise due to the fact that the program would then expand. But let me get to my speech. It is said that it takes a village to raise a child. However, in today's society, with traditional senses of community and family having been lost in the hustle and bustle of present day Cayman, in my speech, I will look at the ways in which the parents and the Department of Children and Family Services can be more involved. Mr. Speaker, first, we need to be able to identify the problem. In order to identify the problem, we have to know the warning signs of a possible at-risk youth. Signs such as parents that are overstressed, their families being of a low socioeconomic status, Families that do not have other family members or friends that are able to help. Their parents are abusive, whether it be physical or emotional. There are signs of drug or alcohol abuse, and even children that are being neglected. Now, I do understand that it would be inconvenient for the Department of Children and Family Services to walk into people's homes and watch each family to determine if that child has an at-risk youth. Instead, the department will work in conjunction with the schools to find which youth are in need of assistance. This can be achieved through, the getting, through getting in contact with the various tutorial instructors, which would have a better understanding of which students are at risk. Some signs of at-risk at children in schools are low attendance at school, 
provided that there isn't a serious illness, poor behavior, marks from physical abuse, and the language and context in which the students refer to home or family life. Mr. Speaker, my second point of emphasis is on how we can alleviate, or in other words, fix these problems. As in any situation, vigilance is key. And being able to give instructors the information and training needed to appropriately help a child that is struggling would be vital. Mentors and instructors can help by listening to the student's problems or concerned, providing the, need, the needed encouragement and support, and getting them in contact with others that could further help. Also, this can be done by simply letting them know that they are there to help. Although we are looking to provide teachers with the knowledge, parents must also be equipped with the information needed to handle whatever situation presents itself. Having this information, this information can be crucial to providing a better home environment for our young person. Mr. Speaker, I want you to understand that we are being careful not to pass judgment, nor to place a label on anyone just because of their socioeconomic status. We are looking to help those that are in need by creating a greater hope for the future. The Department of Children and Family Services has been making the lives of Caymanian students better through providing breakfasts for those less fortunate. Also, when we, as the leaders of the Cayman Islands, saw a need to provide housing, we executed our own plan to provide affordable housing, which has been a help to the people of the Cayman Islands. This leads me to ask, why shouldn't we make an effort to give guidance to our leaders of tomorrow? Mr. Speaker, my final point is a short one and is focused on the results we are hoping to achieve through this program. We are hoping that our program will encourage these at-risk youth to strive for greatness. Through associating with mentors, students will have a chance to become more involved members of their community. Ideally, this environment and this involvement with the community will open doors and will help provide future jobs for those that are involved in the program. After all, isn't the government supposed to help with creating jobs for our citizens and just leaving them there so our young people can go and claim them. In summary, we the LA recognize that there is a problem facing our youth, and we intend to fix the problem with the previously mentioned suggestions. Also, we are confident that with the support provided through the partnerships formed by parents, mentors, and the department, our young people will succeed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? I recognize the six elected member for Georgetown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in my speech, I will be discussing the links between school and crime. The United Nations Guidelines for the Prevention of Juvenile Delinquency Fundamental Principles state the prevention of juvenile delinquency is an essential part of crime prevention in society. By involving in lawful, socially useful activities and adopting a humanistic direction towards society and outlook on life, young people can develop non-criminogenic attitudes. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, the Cayman Islands are thought to be one of the safest islands in the Caribbean. However, if we ignore the growing problem of juvenile delinquency, this beautiful island will lose, the reputa repu lose that repu reputation very quickly. Throughout the world, people are affected by juvenile crime. It affects parents, neighbors, teachers, and families. It affects the victims of the crime, the perpetrators, and the bystanders. In 2008, the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, reported that the Caribbean ranked first globally 
when it comes to murder rates and claims the highest rates of homicides among young people aged 15 to 17. Boys are six times more likely to be victims than girls in, the, in regards to armed violence. Witnessing violence in the home or being physically or sexually abused, for instance, may condition children or adolescents to become victims or perpetrators of armed violence, and understanding these factors is, es is essential for developing effective policies and programs to prevent this vi violence. Now, according to Dr. Denise Grodfordson, a professor at the University of Maryland Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology, Schools have, schools have great potential as a focal point for crime prevention. They provide regular access to students throughout the developmental years and perhaps the only consistent access to large numbers of the most crime prone young children in the early school years. Our local schools are staffed with individuals paid to help youth develop as healthy, happy, productive citizens. So adding extra programs that addresses the precursors of delinquent behavior in Cayman's youth should not be overlooked. Many of the precursors of delinquent behavior are school related and therefore likely to be amendable. So change through school based intervention, um, intervention like established programs are not rare. Research on the link between school and delinquency have been done in countries like the USA, Australia, Denmark, Germany, the United Kingdom and many others. Since many times the definition of problem children or juvenile delinquents are often confused, most, most ask whether or not it is possible to sort these children out from the rest of the student population. So here I will list several school-related signs that lead to delinquency, including factors such as characteristics of school and classroom environments, individuals' personal school-related experiences and attitudes, peer group um, peer group experiences, personal values, attitudes, and beliefs. School environment factors related to delinquency include availability of drugs, alcohol, and other things such as weapons. Characteristics of the classroom and, social organ and school social organization, such as strong academic missions, and direct executive, executive leadership, and a climate of emotional support. With the establishment of the official mentoring program in public school described in the private member motion number three of 2015, an, an environment that is free of the negative influences that are described above can be provided for Cayman's youth. Schools related, school related experiences and attitudes, which often lead to delinquency, include poor school performance and attendance, low attainment in school, and low commitment to schooling, as mentioned in the previous arguments in the, in the debate. Peer-related experiences, many of which are school-centered, include rejection by peers and association with newer delinquent peers. Personal values. These can be developed in a number of different ways. The most prevalent way is through upbringing and close family relatives proving to be role mo models to these children. Now, the nature of school-based prevention, Mr. Speaker, has been addressed specifically on the report of predisposing factors to criminality in the Cayman Islands. It states that it is imperative that school-based prevention programs must be, quote, well-designed plan of remedial education that is developed and firmly pursued in order to ensure that from an early age, low achievers are given the kind of a special and dedicated attention they need and deserve. Close quotation. So that means that detached methods such as short-term counseling that would probably happen in lunch times from like 30 to 40 minutes, those won't work. They will only have small effects, if any at all, because they fail to capitalize on the full range of effective and most benefiting strategies that are available. An example of a non-personal approach to counseling is a drug instruction program called Drug Abuse Resistant Education, otherwise known as DARE. Now measuring the, effective, if the effectiveness of school-based pr prevention programs require attention to the interventions to prevent a variety of forms of problem behavior, 
including theft, violence, rebellious behavior, antisocial behavior, aggressive behavior, and defiance of authority. These different forms of delinquent behavior are highly connected and share common causes. And of course, the steady and ready cooperation, cooperation of parents is also a very important factor. I'll leave you with things to think about. There have been numerous programs that have attempted to lower the rate of juvenile delinquency. I'm not going to lie. There are some greatly successful, there are some that were greatly successful, while many others have minimal to no impact. However, what can be said about those programs that have been proven less than successful is that those programs did not have the same level of intimacy as a proposed program offering mentoring program in the public school described in the private member motion number three of 2015 and other successful programs. If we do not wish, if we do not do this right, the programs that aren't successful are a waste of our, our, of our resources. The most successful programs can continue to be implemented and improved, while those that do not work are discontinued immediately. Why do this earlier than later? A number of different types of programs currently exist. Those that get involved with the delinquent after the occurrence of deviant behavior tend to be less successful, since by that point, Antisocial habits are already well established. Most effective programs are the ones that intervene before the onset of delinquent behavior and prevent that behavior from developing into worse characteristics that will then lead to horrible life choices. By getting involved in children's lives earlier, later crime can be effect easily effectively reduced. Preventing programs positively impact the general public because they stop the increase in crime from happening in the first place. One aspect of exceptionally successful prevention programs is how comprehensive they are to the individual child. Programs that are more all-inclusive prevent future crime better because they deal with the various aspects of a child's life, not just one. Rather than focusing on shaming and terrorizing youth to ter to deter them from future crime, we should invest instead in a variety of treatment and supportive services and community-based recovery support services that teens in the juvenile justice system need to be successful. We cannot sit back and do nothing and watch as our youth destroy the island, its future, their future, and themselves. Not now, in this day and age, not ever. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? I recognize the Honorable Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to offer a short contribution to the debate regarding the regulations on opposition motion number three, in which they are proposing that the government implement mentoring programs for at-risk youth in our public schools. As mentioned before, an at-risk youth has characteristics such as behavioral and emotional problems that make them less likely to transition successfully into adulthood and therefore needs intervention. Also noteworthy, a mentoring program is defined as a program in which mentors are matched with young people who need or want a caring, responsible adult in their life. Mr. Speaker, this program applies both to primary and high schools. It is a one-on-one -on -one mentoring program that is aimed towards helping young individuals with a combination of poor behavior and grades successfully transition into adulthood. Students will be selected based on a predetermined criterion. The, deter the duration of the program for primary students will be on a term basis with two hours worth of sessions per week. For the high school students, the duration of the program will be one day per month, yearly. The predetermined criterion mentioned earlier is simple and fairly straightforward. Students that have a combination of bad behavior during school, below average grades, an unstable home environment, and 
for high school students, if they have a police record, will be selected by their teachers to take part in this mentoring program. Mr. Speaker, this mentoring program will be available for students at the primary level during years four to six with an emphasis on the older students. Students at the high school level would have exposure to this program during years 10 and 11, their final years of school. For both primary and high school levels, the mentoring sessions would be held on the school compound, the mentor's office environment, or a casual environment. Mentors will be volunteers and not employed due to the current government's budget. Volunteers for this position will be required to provide basic background information and a police record in order to ensure the safety of the students at hand. Also, parents would have to be called in for a meeting before and after in regards to the program. Parents must sign a written consent form before their child can take part in the program. In the final stages of the program, to ensure this program has been successful, students will have to go through an assessment. This assessment comprises of the mentee, mentor, parent, and teacher. It includes an interview, assessment of current grades, and behavior reports, and also an assessment in home behavior. Mr. Speaker, no more than 20 students per term from each school may be selected to experience this program at a given time. The reason for this number is so that mentors can effectively guide students throughout the program, not having to rush through a session. Remember, at-risk youth are a minority and not the majority. Attacking the situation, these situations in small sections at a time will be more effective in the eyes of the government. Mr. Speaker, as is every mentoring program, this will have its disadvantages and advantages. These will apply both to the mentee and the mentor. The advantages for the mentee include healthier relationships and lifestyle choices in the student's life, increased high school graduation rates, and improved behavior at home and in school. The benefits for the mentor are increased patience and improved supervisory skills and a sense of accomplishment. However, there are disadvantages. Mentoring programs may increase enrollees' awareness of their disadvantages, which can lead to disappointment and risky behaviors. A major disadvantage for the mentees and mentors are that the mentees can become too attached to their mentors. The government will implement regulations to help combat these disadvantages. We will make sure that students are aware that this program is not to quote unquote put them down, but to enrich their futures. We will also set borders for the mentees and mentors to abide by so that the mentees do not become too dependent on their mentors. Mr. Speaker, we, the government, support the opposition's, opposition's motion to implement mentoring programs in the public schools. However, this will be implemented with the changes that have been brought forward today by my colleagues and myself. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Does any other member wish to speak? Okay. If no other member wishes to speak, I will ask the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, the first elected member for Georgetown, to exercise his right of reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the government members for the constructive contribution they've made. I would like to agree with the Honorable Minister of Education when she said that more students need to, would, should be assigned to a mentor. Also, that mentoring can be implemented for primary school in the primary, for the primary students in the primary school. I would also like to comment on what the Honorable Minister of Community Affairs mentioned. We, the opposition, are aware of the cons, uh, and we do strongly believe that these disagreements, disadvantages, sorry, are worth combat combating. In my speech, I mentioned that mentors will have the same interests and skills, which is how we will be uh, assigning mentors to mentees. Also, Mr. Speaker, the deputy, the honorable deputy governor, said that I mentioned one program in Cayman. I did not do, and that I did not do my research. It would, I would like to clarify that in my speech, I did say the one, and I quote, the, uh, the mentoring 
Cayman by the Chamber of Commerce is one of many uh, well-known mentoring programs in Cayman. Also, she made the remark that we, the opposition, have not focused on other mentoring programs. With all due respect, Deputy Governor must not have been listening to the point made by the fourth elected member for Bordentown on the case of Mentoring Cayman. The only other member mentoring program is the Big Brothers Big Sister, but I remark that the program, this program is heavily underfunded by the government. I would also like to agree with the, hon the Honorable Minister of Finance when he needed the equipped, when he, mm. I would also like to agree with the Honorable Minister of Finance when he said that the parents would be also needed to be equipped along with the teachers. This would indeed help with the bettering of our youth. Mr. Greeker, also regarding that the Honorable, also regarding what the Honorable Attorney General, regarding what he said about the primary schools and would like to, and I would like to accept that he was saying about the ground rules, such as no rushing through the program and implementations that he said. Thank you. The question is, be it now therefore resolved that the government considers implementing a formal mentoring program within the public high schools to promote the personal and professional development of students with specific emphasis on the at-risk youth. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Private members motion number three, mentoring program in public high schools has passed. That concludes the proceedings of this eighth youth parliament. I will now call on the honorable premier to move a motion for the adjournment. Mr. Speaker, I move the adjournment of this honorable eighth youth parliament, signe die. Mr. Speaker, before you put forward the motion, I wish to extend my thanks on behalf of the government. It has been an honor and a great opportunity to be a part of the CPA's 8th Youth Parliament. However, it would have not been possible without a few persons. This year, for the first time, Youth Parliament shadowed the individual who they, who they represented today. I'd like to thank the chief officers in the ministries and portfolios, the ministers, the deputy governor, and the attorney general for taking the time to spend with us to explain their work in their ministries. I'd like to thank Dr. Dax Basidio and Mr. Norman Bodden who came in to share their expertise. Thanks to Ms. Anita Cornish, Senior Policy Advisor in the Ministry of Education for assisting with debates, to Cayman Airways for their sponsorship and to the sponsors of the certificates. Thank you to the members of the Youth Parliament Organizing Committee who play a key role in ensuring this happens every year. Mr. Bernie Bush, Mr. Alva Saku, and Mr. Winston Connolly. Special thanks to the two ladies who work tirelessly with us every Tuesday and Saturday, Mrs. Zena Marin Chin and Ms. Shiona Allinger. Thank you for allowing us to create this memorable experience. We've learned so much and grown as young adults. We are truly grateful for your advice and words of encouragement these past few months. I'd like to end with this quote to my fellow parliamentarians by Orson Marden. Success is not measured by what you accomplish, but by the opposition you have encountered and the courage by which you have maintained the struggle against overwhelming odds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the Honorable Leader of Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I would also wish to thank Mr. Alvin Saku, Mr. Bernie Bush, and Mr. Winston Connolly, members of the Youth Parliament Organizing Community without which we won't be having a success as we are today. The Minister of Ministers and Deputy Governor, the Attorney General, for taking the time to spend with the Youth Parliament to explain their ministries. The Chief Officers in the ministries and the portfolios where the Youth Parliament shadowed. Dr. Dax Bestio, Chief 
officer in the Ministry of Financial Services, assisting with information on Sunday trading law. Mr. Norman Bowden, assisting with motion on Sunday trading law. Um, Mr. Michael Miles, program coordinator and license officer at Risk Youth, assisting with the opposition motion. Mr. Mark Freeman, Ms. Arthur Pedley, and Ms. Kimberly Wood, assisting with the preparation for the debate. Our parents, guardians, for bringing us here each Saturday and during the week, and Ms. Zena, uh, Ms. Zena Marion Chin, and Ms. Shiona Allinger, and the rest of LA staff for sticking with us throughout the entire course of the U Parliament, as well as the sponsors and the gift server tickets. We thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion is that this Honorable Eighth Youth Parliament to stand adjourned, sign a die. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. This Honorable Eighth Youth Parliament now stands adjourned, sign a die.